Good morning. How's everybody? So if the Buffalo Bills beat the Baltimore Ravens today, it will eliminate atheism as we know it. Because <laughs> no one will be able to deny there is a God. So, just something to think and pray about. Okay. Thrilled you're here today. Uh, launching a, a new series called The Light of Christmas. And we're going to look at one of the very earliest prophecies, the foretelling of what God intended to do. It's very rich in language, and, and honestly, it makes reference to some historical events we'll unpack in our time together today. But we're in Isaiah chapter 9. It says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke of bur that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on, his David's, on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then in John's Gospel, the first chapter, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. This passage has long been considered a Christmas passage. It refers to a great light shining, shining in a deep darkness. So what's the darkest room you've ever been in? How did you get there? Uh, for some of us, maybe it was just a power failure. For others, maybe someone closed the door. Maybe someone put a blindfold on you. To be in a dark room is one thing, and if you try to walk in a dark room, you do walk differently. A little less confidently, a little more cautiously. Another question might be, what's the darkest moment of your life? There's a lot of similarities. There's times when we go through a devastating loss. Maybe we feel betrayed by someone. Maybe the realization that someone or even ourselves, was not what we hoped that we would be. And so we, we wish that light would shine because our assumption is, is if the light shines, I can walk a little bit more confidently. I can be more effective because I can see what I'm doing. I can be more prepared because I know what will be coming. So Isaiah begins to describe a deep darkness. And this darkness isn't just in a house or room. It's, it's not just in a neighborhood. It's in an entire land is covered in this deep darkness. So the assumption is anybody in darkness would really like a light to shine. But I'm going to challenge that assumption a little bit today. So let's take a look at this as, it, as Isaiah unpacks it and as the Apostle John unpacks it. And the first is, is that God provides a great light that wins great battles. There's a really interesting reference here. It says, in the day of Midian's defeat... And um, that actually refers to a story that is included in the book of Judges, chapters 6 and 7. And there had been a season where the nation of Israel had done reasonably well, but their neighboring country, Midian, had quite a powerful army, and they would actually ally with other nations around them, and they would come in during harvest time, and just when it was time to to harvest all the fields, they would come in and take as much as they could carry away and destroy what they couldn't carry away. The intent was to weaken 
the nation of Israel. And they didn't just do this to the produce from the ground. They did this to the livestock as well. Take as much as they could. Destroy anything that was left. And Israel got into a routine of retreat. Every year at harvest time, they would just pack up their bags and they would follow the trails to secret hiding places where they didn't have to be at risk and they would just allow the enemy to come in. And it was a habit of running away from the thing that limited their life or could eliminate their life. And it was a very deep darkness. So God sent a prophet to them to shed some light on the situation because that's often how God sheds light. What he was telling them is that if they wanted to deal with the dark times they were living in, they actually had to start with a darkness that was in their own heart. This is not what people like to hear. We want the macro issues to be fixed before we deal with any micro issues in our own heart. And what God did is he began to remind them that there had also in their ancestor time been a season of great darkness where they'd been enslaved in the land of Egypt and, and God had brought them out. So he reminded them of that. And then he showed them how they were contributing to the situation that they were in. God was not at all overlooking or excusing the atrocities of the Midianites. But the thing about the light is that when it shines, it shows everything not just the stuff about other people that we don't like. And so the light began to dawn. So God sends an angel to a guy by the name of Gideon, who's kind of a reluctant leader in helping to bring freedom back to the nation of Israel. He eventually calls for as many people to help him as possibly can, and 32,000 men show up to help defend Israel, which sounds like a lot, but they were still outnumbered four to one. That's quite an quite a, a, a overwhelming number to be up against. But God tells Gideon, you have way too many people. Because if you win this battle, even at these odds, you will think that this is because of you. And assuming that you can fix everything on your own, that is a deep darkness. So he says, so tell all the men who are feeling anxious about their ability to perform well in battle that they are, they are given a, a leave of absence and they can go home. And 22,000 men walked away. I know, down to 10,000 people. Gideon's feeling a little less confident and God comes to him and says, still too many. And so God says, here's the test. Take them down to the water to get a drink. And everyone who just sticks their face in the water and pulls the water in out that way, they're going to be disqualified. Only the people who cup the water and bring it up to their mouth are going to be successful. 9,700 people did not pass the test. He's left with 300. I know you thought 300 was an animated series or movie about some Spartans who stood up against the Babylonians. Nope, the original 300 is right here. And they're given a really unusual strategy. They're to divide into three groups of 100 each. And they are to go in around the sleeping enemy of which there's over 130,000 soldiers. They are given a trumpet, a clay pot, and a torch. In case you're wondering if that was ever considered weapons of warfare, it never has been. And so they go in and they sneak into their positions and at the given signal, 300 people in the middle of the night while all of their enemies asleep blast 300 trumpets. How many of that would probably wake you up? Some of you are hard to wake up. And then they would all smash their clay pots, and in the midst of all of that darkness, 300 torches would suddenly be blazing with light, and then they would all shout the sword of the Lord and Gideon, and then just keep blowing their trumpets. The, the soldiers woke up, and they were so disoriented and confused and, and not sure what was happening, and they couldn't see because of all of the light. They just grabbed their sword and started swinging at anything that moved, which was each other. They successfully destroyed themselves. It was quite a battle. Every one of them, because of a light that had shone in the darkness, the enemy was destroyed and a great victory was won. When God shines a light in the darkness, there are battles he intends to win in our lives. Things that we are not able to beat or defeat on our own. 
The second thing is that when God begins to shine light, a great light in our life, it brings new things. John's gospel makes a connection between the birth of Christ and the life of Christ and the light of Christ with the creation of the world. He tells us that he was the word in the beginning, and now the word is being made flesh. But what's interesting is that before everything was created, the entire universe consisted of things that were defined and described in the book of Genesis as formless, empty, and dark. Formless, empty, and dark. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. As a kid, this always bothered me. When I was in Sunday school classes, and they would tell the creation story, I was always frustrated by the creation story, because on day one there is light, but the sun is not created until day four. So where is this light coming from? Did that bother anybody besides me? I'm just kind of like, I don't know. I'm sure there's a, 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 a label. <laughs> and, and some of you are going, well, I didn't know that before, but I'm bothered now. Well, just, that, that's why we're here. We bother each other. So what's going on? Well, God began to speak, and when he began to speak, light just flashed across the universe. Science has referred to the auditory component of this. They call it the Big Bang. Scripture refers to the visual aspect. Light shined. And this light goes through the universe, and it reveals everything that is, and it's just empty, and it's void, and it's formless, and it's fruitless. There's nothing there. But out of all of that, God is going to create something. And it starts by him saying something and shining light on those things that we would rather not look at. It's not all that impressive. God begins to create new things, land and sea, sun and stars, plants and animals, a beautiful garden and humans. When God wants to do something new in our lives, he begins by saying something to us. That's how the light begins to dawn. So who doesn't want victories in their life? And who doesn't want new beginnings in their life? Who doesn't want the great light to shine in a deep darkness? Well, it's complicated because the challenge is that light reveals everything, not just the stuff that we want to see. So let me just check. How many here has ever been on a romantic date for dinner? Not as many as I thought. So let me just ask you a question. From what you know about romantic dinners, are the lights up or down? Why? What are we hiding? <laughs> the truth is, you just look better with a little less light. It's what's true. Like, we know that, right? Just turn it down a little bit. You should be very worried if they want to turn it off completely. Like, that's... So on Christmas, the word becomes flesh, and the light of the world enters the deep darkness of our world, and it shows everything. We tend to focus on the nicer aspects and characters of the Christmas story, but not everyone is cute or generous in the Christmas story. There's a king who is so insecure that he's willing to give an order to execute children who are two years old and younger. Read through the Christmas story and you see people who are filled with doubt and they're confused and they're afraid and they're insensitive. But it also shows people who are faithful and hopeful and courageous and, and generous. It shows everyone. I heard this story last week, I, and I know you're not going to be very happy about my sharing it. But last week there was a woman in India who had been raped by two men. And so she went and reported this to the authorities and hoped that they could keep her safe. The authorities told the two men what she had done. And those two men went and got three more friends and they dragged her out into the middle of the field and they set her on fire. 65% of her body is burned and she's in a hospital today struggling for her very life. And there are People who go, yeah, I don't want to hear stories like that. I don't want to see that. That's the point. Jesus did not come to hide the sins of humanity. He came to rescue us from them. And there's a lot of difference between those two things. 
This is a dark world, and terrible things happen in it. Darkness is what hides the atrocities of humanity. Light is what reveals them. But God has not come to hide our sins. He's come to rescue us from them. The word, now flesh, appears, and a great light has shined in a deep darkness. Here's the challenge, and that is, is that in our darkness, we often think like this. We define love and acceptance as someone who thinks we're perfect the way we are. Have, don't, don't confess this at all right now. You can talk to God about it later. You can just look straight ahead and pretend like you're not paying attention. Or you can actually not pay attention. <laughs> but sometimes we say things like this to people, I wouldn't change a thing about you. And they interpret that as love and acceptance. That's what our culture now calls love, is that not just someone that accepts you as you are, but they wouldn't challenge anything or call anything out in you or affirm any of your potential because that always runs the risk of being misunderstood. And so in our darkness, we've actually defined love and acceptance as never changing. And you have to know, that's not what God has come into our world to do. He didn't come into our world to never change us. He accepts us as we are, but aren't you glad the grace of God never leaves us as we are? That's what's absolutely fascinating. He notices. And, and here's the thing. You, you've probably been around some people who they're a little bit critical, maybe a little bit judgmental, and they actually think that they'll even say, I'm just, I'm just shining the light on your problems. Okay, well, this is what I will tell you. Judgmentalism is often a way for someone to feel better about themselves, not to help someone else get any better. And judgmentalism is not a form of light. It's another form of darkness. To us... A son is born. A child is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. That God comes into our life and he doesn't use sin as a way to create distance. He's going to deal with it. When he shines light on us, he doesn't just notice what's wrong. He also sees the potential. And, and he speaks words to us about what we could be. And you need to know that's not always comforting and encouraging to us. When we've been walking in darkness for a long time, we get a little bit overly sensitive in our hearing. That sense gets a little... And when someone starts talking about potential, we hear criticism. You have to know God will not leave us as we are. So God has come not to use our sins against us, but to remove our sin from us. That means he's got to deal with stuff. So that's where this passage from Isaiah is so helpful. This child that is born, this son that is given, what are the things that define and describe him? He's a wonderful counselor. He listens to the expressions of our deepest longings and our deepest disappointments and our greatest wounds and our most challenging failures and fears. He shines light on the well-worn pathways that keep yielding reoccurring defeats in our life. He's a mighty God. He's not just a good listener. He actually has authority to act in our behalf. He doesn't just tell us that we need to dig deeper and try harder. He does things for us we cannot do for ourselves. And he's the everlasting father because he can continually birth new life in us. It's not just something that happened once and it's done. And our relationship with him doesn't end because he is eternal. And he is the prince of peace. Now, this is interesting. So uh, all of us, or most of us, are heading into some family situations. Once again, don't give any knowing glances at all. Just kind of process this internally. But how many of you know you're going to have to go into a family or friend situation, and you're not happy about it, but you're going to behave so that you can keep the peace this Christmas season? And if you're sitting there going, yeah, I don't, I don't have any of those situations, you might be the person they're trying to keep the peace with. Just, you need to know that. 
There goes that shining light again, right? Let's turn that thing off. And so Israel thought they were keeping peace when they kept running away. And their children are going to bed hungry at night because there's no food. And they're, they're living under a yoke of oppression. That's not peace. The peace is what happened when victory was won on their behalf. The Prince of Peace has come to wage the greatest battle of all. It's against sin and death. And he defeats them and his light shines. Those who have lived in darkness have seen a great light. And it changes us forever. So I actually thought I would like to end our talk today by having a conversation with someone about how the light began to dawn in their own life, what God was calling them to do, and where he was calling them to go. And so would you please welcome to the platform at Calvary this morning, Stephen Grosh. So, yeah, thanks. I'm really glad you're here. So who are you and why are you here? I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> he's, he's Stephen Gray. Yeah, so Rochester's not new to you. You actually lived here for a while. Is that right? I worked with here in the, with the church for a couple of years uh, yeah. over in Pittsburgh. Yeah, so it's, it's great to have you back in the Rochester area. So do you remember our winters? Yes. I, in fact, my children didn't get to come with me, and they're a little bit jealous that I get to see the snow. So enjoy the snow. Yeah, well, we would share it with them if we could, but yeah. <laughs> So at some point in your life, as you're growing up, I think you said you grew up in church world, there came a point at which just sitting and listening and observing wasn't the only option, that a light began to dawn, that God had something more for you than that. How, how did that happen? For me, it kind of happened before I really even acknowledged who Jesus was in my own life, but having heard about him growing up and hearing sermons and going to church and learning the stories... I, then I heard about people who had never heard about Jesus. And that just blew my mind. I'm like, well, how can that be? Because I've heard about it my entire life. Mm. And so that's when God did begin to draw me and say, well, I need to do something about that. So, so when you started getting, you know, that light began to dawn a little bit, doing something about it, like what options were you considering? Well, the person who told us had been a missionary, so I thought, well, that uh, makes sense, someone who goes around. Of course, you know, I was still in middle school, so I thought, well, I guess I can't really go yet, but I always <laughs> wanted to go, but uh, well, I had told my friends, and some had a different kind of response, but was looking forward to going overseas. So in, in going overseas, obviously, you serve in a place, and just so you are aware, it's actually a sensitive location, so we're being cautious about how we describe or define this this morning, because this is a streamed service, and it goes outside of these walls. But how did, how did you narrow down where it was you felt God was calling you to? Because, like, the world is a big place, and there's a lot of people who haven't heard, so how did you figure that out? It's true. There are a lot of people, and, you know, there's one way you just spin the globe, <laughs> and you put your finger on it. I thought about that. It didn't really work for me. Um, so I finally got to go on a, my first mission trip to Bolivia in South America. And this was a great opportunity when I was in high school. And I was so excited to finally get to go. I went down there. We were able to do some drama and minister. And there was some pushback. But I felt like God was saying, yes, this is what I called you to do, is to go to those places and share the gospel, but not here. And so it was part of that, yes, this is in the right path, but not the right place. And so God, it was God directing me to go over. Um, to Central Asia, where I ended up yeah. through that process. So that, that process of, of this is the right thing to be doing, not necessarily the right location, like that's kind of a, that can be a, a frustrating process to work through. So how did you manage that? Well, but I got back from the trip and, you know, I finished high school and I told my pastor, I said, okay, I'm ready to go. And he's like, oh, no, you're not. I think you should go to Bible college. So I, I did that. It was really during that time of Bible college where I began to pray and really was seeking God, saying, God, what does this look like? Because, I mean, there are a lot of places. And really could begin to get burdened for the places where missionaries had not gone. Hmm. And so that was where Central Asia was. We called it the 1040 window between the 10th and the 40th parallel. And kind of right in the middle of that are all these countries that, when I was in school, was just called the Soviet Union. And so I began to pray, and then God began to lead me to not only pray for them, but begin to have a passion and a burden for them. Yeah, that, just in case you, you don't know, that 1040 window, 80% of all the people on the planet that have not heard the gospel are in that block. 
it, it's really, it, it, it's remarkable, and I'm, I'm so grateful that in some way that light began to dawn, not only on what you were supposed to do, but where you were supposed to do it. Now, if I remember right, when you headed out on missions, you did not have a family. You weren't married, you didn't have kids, so... so some things have changed. Some th <laughs> so why don't you tell us about those changes? Yeah, when I was here working in Rochester, I was single, and then I realized that the last time I was here, I was had my bride with me, Tiffany, Yeah. and then I realized that I think we only had a little baby. Uh, Eliza is now 10, so it's been a few years. So thank you for sticking with me through those years. Eliza is 10, Ezra is 8, and our littlest is Ezekiel, who's 4 now. So That's great. That's God, God's blessed us with a wonderful family. So what we want to say to you is, is thank you for allowing light to come into your life that provided some clarity about what you were to do and where you were to do it. And I know you're in a place in the world where it can get as, as, as warm as 130 degrees in the summer and feet of snow in the winter. So that's like the ultimate vacation destination, right? We all want to go there. Uh, yeah. so. But I know. <laughs> but aren't you glad that when the light began to dawn for Stephen, that he didn't fight it and he didn't run from it? He allowed God to do something in him through it. And that's what makes the difference. So I'd like you to do something with me this morning. Would you just extend a hand towards Stephen? And let's lift him and his family up as they continue to bring light to others. So, Father, um, I'm so grateful that even at a very young age, when light began to dawn, it was something of a sense of adventure to Stephen. And he looked for ways to walk in it. And over these years, that light has not faded in his life. His passion has grown even more. Thank you for bringing love into his life and for the gift of children in his life. But thank you that that could be all the more reason why he would be fearful of going certain places. And thank you that he's willing to go because he honestly believes there's no place of darkness, that the light shouldn't be available. That grace transforms our lives and everyone should have the opportunity. I ask that you would continue to not only shine light in his life, but through his life until everyone knows. In Jesus' name. All who agree to that prayer said, amen. amen. Um, honestly, it could be tempting in a season of expansion just to focus only on walls and roofs and things that need to go up. And what you have to know is that we've worked really hard to make sure that doesn't happen. So we haven't scaled back our commitment to light shining in other places just because we want to increase square footage of this place. And in fact, if you give anything to Calvary Assembly, there's a portion of your contribution that winds up going far outside of any neighborhood around here and to other nations. Because of the sensitive nature of, of where Stephen serves, you'll find less information about him and the place that he serves on our website than some of our other missionaries. I'm wondering if maybe what God might be doing in your heart today is a light is beginning to dawn, not just to know that a portion of your contribution goes to missions, but do you actually want to do something above and beyond for missions? And what I would want you to know is that if you do that, every dime of that goes to the missionaries. We don't hold anything back for for operation cost or anything like that. If, if a dollar comes in, a dollar goes out. And what you might not know is not only do we send out every dollar that comes in, but thousands and thousands of dollars additionally go out just because we want to make sure everywhere there's darkness, everywhere, that they have the opportunity to see a great light. So this morning, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. And I'm just going to ask you to trust that God can take something like currency and convert it to light. 
that it makes a real difference in real places. Father, thank you. Thank you for generous hearts. Thank you that your light has shined in our lives. Um, some of the things it shows us can be fearful or frustrating, but the reason we're able to endure is because you are there. And you're not using it as a reason to push us away. You're dealing with things so that we can get even closer to you. Help us know that our resources are doing that today. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>